Our next speaker is uh, Depesh Navsaria, MD, a pediatrician working in the public interest. He blends the roles of physician, occasional children's librarian, educator, public health professional, and child health advocate. With graduate degrees in public health, children's librarianship, physician assistant studies and medicine, he brings a unique combination of interests and experience together. An associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. He is the director of the MDMPH uh, program there as well as the medical director of the physician assistant program. Clinically, he has practiced primary care pediatrics with special interest in underserved populations. He is the founding medical director of Reach Out, and read Wisconsin. Dr. Navzaria aims to educate the next generation for those who work with children and families in realizing how their professional roles include being involved in larger concepts of social policy and how they may affect the cognitive and socio-emotional development of children for their future benefit. Please welcome Dr. Navzaria. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. How is everyone doing? Great. Um, I'll start off by answering the question that many people have when they uh, read my bio and see all the letters after my name and so on. Yes, I have a lot of student loan debt. So <laughs> let's get that out of the way. So it's really a delight to be here with you today. Um, this is not my first time in Indianapolis, uh, but always a pleasure to, to come back here. I actually spent several years in Champaign-Urbana, just across the Illinois border. Um, and uh, when my children were young, we used to frequently visit the Children's Museum here. So uh, uh, really a delightful treasure that you have here. And um, I've managed to have the opportunity to come back and speak a number of times. And uh, it's really wonderful to see how much engagement and interest there is around issues of children and families in Indiana um, at all levels. Uh, we heard some wonderful policymakers earlier who really are thinking deeply and thoughtfully about um, all these uh, issues at varying levels. Um, so in the medical world, of course, we always have disclosure slides. So I'm not relevant for this one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, although, as you'll see, the one, the one thing that I, I do have to say is that I'm not sure if mouthing is an FDA-approved use of uh, uh, board books. Uh, this is my son, who's now 17 and applying to college, and he's incredibly embarrassed that I show this photo, so I, 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 I keep showing it, of course. So the wonderful thing about, about working in healthcare and all is that there's a lot of things that we come to and talk about and share, but come at from different lenses. So uh, you just heard from a, um, a, an amazing accomplished psychiatrist who I did not have the opportunity to meet in person until today. Um, and so many little elements that I'll be sharing with you, um, you will have heard bits and pieces of, but we look at them from kind of different viewpoints, uh, but, but still fundamentally agree, of course. So we'll talk on our brief voyage together today. We're going to talk about the science of early brain development. Um, and you'll hear some elements of this that uh, you've already heard, but kind of thinking about it from a different lens. We'll talk about what happens when things don't go so well, and then talk about some principles of solutions, including an example from the work I do, um, and then kind of wrap it up from there. So let's start by talking about the science of the early brain. So over a decade ago, the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child said, let's take all the research that's out there and let's try to pull this together into some key points that we can use to talk about um, how we inform advice we give, how we set up good programs, and how we enact excellent policies in our, in our communities. And even though this report is over 10 years old, um, I have to say that everything that's come since has only strengthened what's in there um, and really re-amplified it in a number of ways. So I, I'm going to walk us through those points because I think it's so easy to get lost when you look at research, right? One study comes out saying this and you say, oh, okay, does that mean I should change what I'm doing? Should we alter what we're doing? You know, it's hard to know. So by taking these big, broader points, I think it helps us keep our eyes on things. And I, I, I loved at the, the, the questions at the end of the last presentation asking yourself, does what we're about to do actually accomplish? Does it help? Does it hinder? Kind of taking that big picture look, I think, is a great way to keep yourself from going off in the, the wrong direction. So the first thing they did was they came out and said, child development is a foundation for community and economic development. 
right now we don't, we're not used to talking about kids this way. Right? A kid walks into a room and you don't say, hello, future potential economic unit. You know, you know you, you, we, we, we like helping kids because we think they're worth you know, supporting and helping and so on. We don't think about them as future drivers of our economy in many cases. But we need to recognize that when we talk about infrastructure in our society, and infrastructure is often associated with um, you know, highways and bridges and tunnels and airports, and, and all of those are important. But we don't talk about the infrastructure of the early brain as being part of that infrastructure, right? So we need to recognize that brain infrastructure is as much a part of development as anything else. And we need to talk about it in that way as well as the way that we already talk about it. Number two, brains are built over time. OK, now that, that's kind of obvious, right? Like, duh, OK? But really, think about what that means. One. It means that you can't just put all your money into the first year or two years or three years or whatever of life and then say, OK, we're done. We don't need to do anything else now, right? It's all good. You need to make good early gains, but then you need to support those gains so the trajectory continues upward. You can't just say, we're going to support you until this point, and then OK, no more. Because if the stressors, the issues, whatever, are still all there, and they often are, what we're going to see is a fade out. The fade out effect happens not because the programs didn't work, it's because we stopped paying attention, okay? The other thing about brains being built over time, though, is even though I'll focus so much on the early brain, I want to be really, really clear that it's never too late, okay? There's sometimes a tendency we have to say, oh, look at all this research. If we don't get it right by the time the child is five, forget it. Oh, teenagers, they're a lost cause. Far from it, okay? I want to be really clear about that. Everyone has the capacity to change, to move forward, et cetera, with the right amount of help. It just takes a lot more work and effort to do it later on, which is why I focus so much on the early years. But nothing I say should be construed to mean that it's all over after some particular point in the future. This sort of a three-legged stool for thinking about the development and health trajectories of children. And um, all of these things are important. One is the stuff we look at all the time in healthcare, the, 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 the biological factors, okay? And those, those are important, okay? We need to make sure we focus on them. There's a good reason we do. But we recognize it was not just biology in the classic sense that was the sole determinant of how children would do over time. That place matters, that the socioeconomic environment matters, that the zip code a child is born and brought up in matters more than their genetic code has been clear to us for a very long time. And I do want to remind you that zip code in and of itself, place in and of itself, is not destiny. The reason those zip codes, that some zip codes have issues, is a man-made phenomenon. That means there's a man-made solution to be had. Okay, So we shouldn't just say, oh, they come from a bad neighborhood. Oh, well. Well, what are we doing to actually make sure it's not, quote, unquote, a bad neighborhood? Okay, So we need to recognize those things. But then we realized also that it wasn't just that broader socioeconomic environment. It's also the microenvironment children are in. Who's at home? Who's in their childcare centers? Who's in their neighborhood? And how are those individuals interacting with that child? And that these attachment and relationship patterns that young children have with adults in their environment were the third leg of the stool. And that was really the big breakthrough you know, over the last few decades that we've said, ah, this is also as incredibly essential along with the other two. And that brings me to the third point, that if you had to say, what is it that influences how the human brain wires? Okay, so think about this. A, a newborn baby is actually born fairly helpless. Okay, I mean, think about this, right? You look at a baby goat being born, what are they doing within like two minutes? They're standing up, right? Their legs are still a little wobbly, but they're standing up. My, my in-laws are dairy goat farmers, so I've, I've seen this firsthand, um, right? How long does it take a human baby to stand? Like a year, right? We're kind of useless in many ways when, when you think about it. It takes a long time because there's so much brain development that happens after birth, okay? The, the, the human, the baby brain is not yet ready for so many things, but the payoff to having that extra period of brain development is that we're able to do all this higher order stuff over time. You know, a lot more thinking, abstract thought, et cetera, et cetera. 
So if you said, how is it that these neurons actually wire to, to one another? You need two things. You need the genes to help the coding, right? How does this neural nerve cell wire to another one? And you need experiences to say which neurons are wiring to which other ones and for what purpose. Okay, and that's really key here. And you need both of these things, right? It's like a campfire. You need wood and you need a spark in order to get that campfire going. You can't have one without the other. Now, we can't modify genes so much. You heard about epigenetics and I'm not gonna dwell on that. But we can modify experiences. And how do we modify experiences? Well, it's through the advice we give. It's through programs we set up. And it's through policies we enact. That modifies experiences in that child's environment so that that child is hopefully wiring a brain that wires for love, for learning, for curiosity, for social purpose, and not a brain that is primarily wiring for fear, for self-defense, for constantly looking for security, et cetera, et cetera, because that's what they've had to put up with, right? So you need both of these things together in order to decide, and again, we, the, the big lever we can pull is experiences, okay? And we do that again through advice, policies, and programs. And then if you said to me, okay, that's great, but what's the number one thing we should be focusing on? What's the laser focus that we should be having, the question we should be asking about what makes the biggest difference? That active ingredient, so to speak, is what we call a child's engagement in serve and return interactions with loving, caring adults in their environment. And I'm gonna say that one more time because if you remember nothing else from what I say today, this is, this is the thing to remember. The thing that matters the most is a child's engagement in loving, nurturing interactions with caring adults in their environment. That is the only thing that drives development forward in a young child. By young, in this case, I mean under age three, period. This means there is no book on its own, no TV program, no DVD, and no app that does anything positive for child development unless there is an adult involved directly in whatever's happening. This is really important, thank you. Um, this is really important because there's a huge industry out there marketing stuff to parents. Please put your child in front of this DVD before they're three. It's good for their learning. Please put them in front of this toy. It helps their development before they're one. Please implant this iPhone in utero with this app so that they can start like, yeah, we haven't gotten there yet, right? But right, this is the messaging. There is absolutely zero meaningful real research showing any of this to be true. As one of my colleagues said, there is no app to replace your lap. T-shirts available in the lobby. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, okay. So, so, so. so this is really important because we are preying on parents who want to do well. And guess what, right? We see parents sometimes and their kids are in front of the device and all that stuff. And then we judge them, right? How could you let your kid be on that device? They just got told this is good for their brain. Yes, by people trying to make a quick buck off of them, right? So they're trying to do good parenting. So instead, we need to kindly and gently educate and try to move things in a different direction and not say, how could you put your kid in front of that, right? So, so we need to think about that aspect. So I want to share a video with you. When I was an undergrad, I worked at the Child Development Unit um, at Children's Hospital in Boston. Edtronic developed this face-to-face -face paradigm that some of you may be familiar with. He'll explain what it is. You'll see what happens when these back-and-forth responsive nurturing interactions go well what happens when they don't go so well, and then the recovery that happens when it's short-term. I'll let him explain. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago, when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. Yeah. In this still phase experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like a girl. 
and she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good is no reparation and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. So I used to code these videotapes when I was an undergrad and the hard part actually wasn't seeing recordings like that, right? That was kind of what we expected, right? Mom went into a still face, baby didn't get the response and she kept on doing these ex escalating bids for attention, right? Hey mom, why aren't we doing this? Okay, let me try this, let me try this, eh, not working. Okay, and finally just got upset and, and broke down. But mom came back, yay, big smiles, all was good, right? The hard part would be when you'd see, watch videos like this, mom would go into the still face and the baby didn't seem to care. Didn't seem too bothered by it, why? because they weren't used to this back and forth interaction. They weren't used to this, this responsiveness. So this was normal to them, so they didn't get upset. Now, I wanna be really clear about something here. I don't believe for a moment that any of the parents in our studies or any parents anywhere don't love their kids, don't want the best for them, don't care for them, and so on, right? This is a universal thing that parents love their children. There's no group out there ethnic, racial, language, socioeconomic, whatever, that has cornered the market on loving their kids better than anyone else loves their own, okay? We, we just gotta be clear about that. The thing is, we view this back and forth, this face-to-face -face interaction with young kids as being automatic, natural, instinctual, right? I got news for you, it's not. It's learned behavior. Now, you learned it, perhaps, without realizing you learned it, right? How many of you took a training class on how to play peekaboo? <laughs> Nine weeks, certificate at the end, right? Yeah, yeah, no one did, right? So how, did you know, how do you know how to play peekaboo with a young child? Someone somewhere did that with a child and you saw what they were doing. And you said, oh, this kid seems to like it. Maybe I should try that, right? And then you go from there and so on. And, and you, you learn it, you try it out, you absorb it from your environment without realizing you're doing so. But what if you're growing up in an environment where you're not seeing that? Where people don't interact with their young kids? You don't see them talking and so on. Okay, so in, in our world, we do a lot of programs to try to help parents interact with their young kids. And what do we do? We put all these messages, right? Because there's an information gap there. If only parents knew that they were supposed to talk, read, sing, play with their young kids, 
then they'd do it, right? So we do all sorts of things. We put ads on the bus, we have billboards by the highway, we have these little things on the radio, right? Talk, read, sing, play with your young kids. And that spans an information gap. Yeah, great, you know what? Those actually work, okay? Parents have heard these messages. They understand it, they get it. The thing is, what happens? Many go home, they sit their six month old down and say, I'm supposed to talk to my child. They told me this is really important for their brain development. I wanna be a good parent, I'm, I'm gonna talk to them. And you start talking to your six month old and within about 12 seconds, you feel kind of stupid. Your six month old's not gonna talk back to you. What are you supposed to say to a six month old? How do you know you're doing it right? Maybe you'll say the wrong things. Maybe you struggled in school and you feel like you're gonna mess them up the way you were messed up, right? You see this cycle of self-doubt, of not feeling like you know what you're doing? We're not gonna fix that through a billboard. So there's an information gap, but there's a second gap, a skills gap, right? And we all have a skills gap, okay? I didn't know how to like accurately diagnose illness on day one of medical school, right? Somebody had to teach me. No one looked at me and said, why don't you already know that, right? So we need to think about maybe people haven't been, had this modeled for them, and maybe we need to just simply model, coach, reinforce, and do all those sorts of things to help bridge that skills gap. So that's a really important principle to keep in mind. The next point is that brain architecture and developing abilities are built from the bottom up. This may sound obvious, but people sometimes say things like, why is childcare so expensive? Somebody just has to play with these kids for a few hours while, they're, while their parents are working. Why is this so difficult? That is a profound misunderstanding of what early childhood education is. And it also is a profound misunderstanding of what play is. Play is not merely about amusement in young children. It is actually an important developmental skill. It is the work of infancy. You heard mentioned earlier about toxic stress, so I'll move through these fairly quickly, but toxic stress in early childhood causes these persistent neuroendocrine effects on the body and damages the architecture of that developing brain and causes the lifelong problems, many of which you heard about earlier. I wanna show you a head CT. These are two three-year-old children. To orient you, this is like you're looking in at the head, almost like there's a cut this way, looking up into the brain, okay? Um, the child on the left is a, is a typically developing child, okay? Um, no, no real uh, concerns or issues. The child on the right is one who underwent extreme emotional neglect, not physical, okay? They were bathed and fed and clothed and all that stuff. This is a child from a large Eastern European orphanage back in the 1980s, okay? Too many kids, not enough staff. You, without knowing a whole lot about how to read a head CT, unless there's any radiologists hiding in here, which there could be, um, would, you can see, though, that those brains look very different. That brain on the right looks small, shrunken, not as dense with neurons as the one on the left. And that is a real difference. If you actually looked at the kids themselves, and I've, I've not actually seen them, I've only seen the head CTs, um, but I've seen similar ch children, th their brains look their heads look unusually small, and of course, there's big time developmental delay. So we have a built-in stress response that helps us deal with key stressors in our environment. And that's good. You know, if you're walking in the woods and you see a bear, you don't want to be sitting here, oh, I wonder what this thing is. Oh, I wonder if it's a nice bear. You know, no, you want to scream and yell and run, right? This is about self-preservation and so on. We have a built-in response that says danger and does things that short term will help guarantee our survival. The problem is that that red alert button, so to speak, is not meant to be used over and over and over again. So most older children and adults can figure out when there's something that seems like a threat. Hmm, okay, maybe I need to investigate this, right? Maybe it's not a bear, maybe it's someone shouting at you, maybe it's someone with a frown on their face, et cetera, et cetera. How do I deal with this? However, if you've never learned those skills, then all you have is the red alert button. And if you keep going for the red alert button over and over and over, well, one, that's not a very good response as you get older. But number two, it causes other problems in, in your body that we'll talk about. So we can think about stress in different ways. So I wanna be really clear. We are not saying kids should have an absolutely stress-free life, 
okay? Small amounts of stress are how we as human beings actually learn and adapt and gain new skills. So some small stress is actually positive, okay? That's important. You have tolerable stressors. These are more significant stressors, but they're buffered by supportive relationships. Ah, there's that relationships piece again, right? And then you have toxic stress, which may be the same as tolerable, but it's prolonged, and there's few or no of those protective relationships. Okay, that might be the key factor. So in a child's life, when you have situations where they don't have those nurturing, supporting, buffering relationships, okay, these are things like child abuse, parental substance abuse, homelessness, which sadly are usually not one-time sorts of things. These are often larger patterns of behavior that happen, right? This is what we call toxic stress because when this happens to young children, it damages their biology in ways that have these lifelong repercussions. So here's the cycle that happens. You have these childhood stressors. They cause that red alert, that fight or flight response to go off all the time, which it was never intended to. They pump out these stress hormones. It causes some changes in the brain that we'll just briefly touch on in just a moment. But here's what we see, this hyper-responsive stress response. They're not as calm, They're, they don't cope as well, and that feeds into more stress. This hyper-responsive stress response is what I hear about in clinic. It's what our schools and early childhood centers are seeing. And sadly, it's probably ultimately what we're seeing in correctional facilities. Right? I, I provide clinical services at our juvenile detention facility in my county um, periodically. And uh, we deliberately at this time do not measure an ACE score. But if I asked, um, it'd be pretty clear to me that the numbers would be sky high. Think about two three-year-olds in preschool, day one. One had a loving, nurturing, responsive you know, home environment. They speak out of turn in story circle. Teacher gets a little frown on their face. Kid sees that and goes, huh, oopsie, shouldn't have done that, right? When mom gets that frown on her face, that means I'm doing something I shouldn't, and they pipe right down. That sort of interaction is barely noticed by anyone, including the people in it, right? Because it's so minor. Kid number two, tons of adversity violence, aggression, et cetera, in their environment, very little nurturing, very little support. Same situation, talk out of turn, teacher gets that little frown on their face. To that kid, that frown is not, oopsie, that frown is, uh-oh. Someone is gonna start yelling. Someone is gonna start throwing things. Someone is gonna beat me. So what do they do? They dive under the table, or they freeze up in a ball or they go running down the hall to get away from the threat because that's all that's going, that red alert. You need to get away, this is danger. And what do we do? We see that kid run down the hall and we say, oh, what's wrong with that kid? That's just ridiculous, nothing happened, they just freaked out. That's the wrong question. The question shouldn't be what's wrong with that kid, the question should be what happened to that kid. What happened that made that response make sense to that little three-year-old? I'm not saying you should allow them to run off, right? You need to maintain order and keep them safe and all those sorts of things, right? But we start asking the right question and start figuring out how we can help and get to the root cause of these things instead of simply saying, that kid screwed up and then medicating them without any other intervention. Medication does have its uses, right? But not as the only solution for everything. So you heard a lot about the brain earlier. I just want to fo refocus on three areas here, right? That amygdala, that's the worry ward of the brain. This is work that's actually been done by my colleague, Seth Pollack at uh, UW-Madison, um, where he uh, does MRI scans of kids' brains. And he sees those who had that early adversity, their amygdala, their fear center, that, oh no, there's a bear here, center is actually enlarged because, not because it came enlarged, but because it became enlarged thanks to the repeated stressors that the brain was exposed to. Countering the amygdala are two areas, the prefrontal cortex, which you heard about earlier, right? Your reasoning, your delayed gratification, and so on. There's less neural density and less activity on functional MRI. And then the hippocampus, which plays a big role in memory and mood, is also affected. And if you think about it, right, a lot of these things, poor memory, labile mood, inability to think ahead, um, constant vigilance for threats, et cetera, sound a lot like what we often call ADHD, okay? A lot of ADHD that I've seen working with um, underserved populations, I'm convinced is not truly ADHD, it's actually trauma. And that's why medications don't work so great. 
and there's no magic medication to make this go away. Intensive therapy, yes, but it's hard to find, hard to implement, and hard for the family to actually follow through, given all the other stressors that are still present in their life. So the result are the sorts of things that you heard about earlier, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which thankfully is making it out more and more and more to more people. Although I still give talks, now I can't ask you if you've heard about it because you just heard about it from the last speaker, even if it was new to you. But for many audiences, I say for them, they still probably haven't heard of uh, the, the ACES study. I wanna highlight something that wasn't mentioned about the ACES study, which that this was looking at 17,000 adults. First time anyone connected um, childhood stuff to what happened later on. People often say, oh yes, ACEs, this is what happens to people living in poverty and adversity. Yes, but it also is happening to everyone else. The people in the ACEs study were middle class, Caucasians, mostly college educated. Okay, this is actually a great study when you look at all the ACEs work that's been done. They looked throughout the socioeconomic spectrum. This is not just about impoverished at-risk populations, this is about all of us. And if I did today what um, was done at a conference that I was at a few years ago, and we gave you little um, audience response clickers and asked you yes, no on all those 10 ACEs categories, we would find a shockingly high number of yeses um, in this audience. Um, I, wasn't, I didn't come up with that, but somebody did that at a conference, and it was amazing to just see, oh my goodness, the people in this room what collectively had, had happened in their own lives. Remember, these are the different categories that were looked at in that study, and the numbers appearing on the right are the prevalence of these things in that population. Crazy high numbers, right? A quarter said they were physically abused. Even the lowest number up there is over one in 20, which is not minor. And since you can't quantify someone's level of trauma with a number, it just doesn't work that way, they said one point for each category gives you an A score. And again, a quarter had one, but many had one in 20 for multiple ACEs, four or five or six yeses. And um, Dr. Harrison showed you some of the long-term effects um, uh, that she sees in terms of physical health associations um, and so on. And again, physical and brain is all intertwined, as she clearly said. Um, let me show you from a younger age, child development, your risk of developmental delay, 75 to 100 percent chance if you have five, six, or seven adverse childhood experiences versus much lower if you have just one or two. Or again, looking ahead, well ahead into adulthood, here's your risk of heart disease, a tripling of the odds if you have seven or eight ACEs versus none. And we could both between us show you probably 100 more slides like that. But the last point that came from that report was that if we get it right early on, it's more effective and less costly than trying to figure it out later, okay? There's a, there's a clear return on investment, both in terms of results, but also financially. So Jack Shankoff at the Harvard Center of the Developing Child points out a few kind of key areas. One, there are too many emotional and behavioral issues layered on top of fantastic intellects. Let me tell you, virtually every kid I see at Dane County Juvenile Detention is actually really smart, really understands what's going on, et cetera, yet they're sitting there in detention, right? There's too many emotional issues on top of these amazing brains. This is lost potential for all of us. Which kid, if we had gotten things right for them, might figure out the cure to Alzheimer's? Or cancer, or get us to Mars, or figure out world peace, or whatever, right? We, we're, we're all losing out. A kid languishing halfway across the country in, in, a, in a youth facility or an adult, had their story been different, actually could alter the lives, our lives, or our children's lives, or whoever, right? So we need to think about this. Number two, I know this is obvious, but children live in families, right? Sometimes there's such a focus on the child that we don't pay attention to the adult. How in the world can we transform the lives of children if we don't transform the lives of their parents as well, since they're the single biggest influence on the child, right? So even if you don't actually care about the parents, and you should, right, recognizing that this is an important part of the context that the child is in is important. And then finally, health and well-being is not just medical care's job, it's actually everyone's job, because clinical care is only 20% of what feeds into um, good health outcomes. 
behaviors, social and economic factors, and physical environment are all the other pieces of that. That's why I direct our MD Masters of Public Health program. I tell people you can do spend four years to learn 20% of the solution, and then you come over to the MPH side and we'll teach you the other 80%. So, so a few numbers to remember. There are 700 new neural connections happening per second in the developing brain. We want those to happen well as to the extent possible. Why? Because of ideas like brain plasticity. There's two types, synaptic and cellular. Don't really worry about what they mean. The key between the two types of plasticity is actually in this third line here. Synaptic plasticity is lifelong. We are all using synaptic plasticity to learn today. But cellular plasticity is already declining by age five. Yes, those kindergartners are over the hill in at least one way. Um, <laughs> So this diminishing cellular plasticity limits our ability to do really good, effective remediation. Again, not impossible, but much harder. It's a lot easier to fix speech delay at age three than it is at age eight. It's a lot easier at 18 months than it is at age three, right? And so on and so forth. We know that disparities in vocabulary start by as early as 18 months, okay? And we know it's not just about the number of words being heard and so on and so forth. But if you look between socioeconomic groups, we can already see disparities popping up by 18 months, and then between the middle and um, lower SES uh, groups by 24 months. Okay, the achievement gap is not an issue of middle schools not doing their job right, or elementary schools, or even preschool. This graph stops at preschool, right, before the start of preschool. It starts, if you can measure it in toddlerhood, you know it started early on. But yet, in our country, even though we are perfectly fine with saying schools for everyone, well-funded schools, et cetera, not arguing that they're all well-funded by all means, um, schools certainly need their funding uh, increased, but we're fine starting that at five, and then before five, we kind of tell parents, you're on your own. Figure it out yourself. And that's the fundamental flaw that we have, is that we know now that learning starts at birth, yet our education system and our uh, public approach to education has not kept up with that. And then finally, for every dollar we put into early childhood, four to nine dollars in returns. This is work that's been done by people like James Heckman, Nobel laureate in economics at the University of Chicago, uh, Art Rolnick at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank. They, they say they were, this is all clear. And long before we had all these analyses, Frederick Douglass told us it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Okay, so now that I've depressed everyone, what can we do about it? <laughs> okay. I'll give you the solution. Well, no. What I'm gonna do is actually give you principles of solutions because there's no one magic way to fix this all with one cheap program, right? I, everyone wants to know that. Sorry, it doesn't exist. So what are the things that we need? We need to do solutions that build capabilities, right? Parent doesn't know how to you know, effectively interact with their young child, great. We can teach them that. We need to build capacities. Parent might say, yes, I love reading to my child every night. I, lo I would love to do, do it as often as possible. I'm, I feel like I'm good and effective at it. I can't do it because I'm working my second job at night because my first job doesn't pay a living wage. Okay, they want to be a good parent. They know how to be a good parent for crying out loud. Let's remove the barriers that are keeping that from happening. Do things that are based in homes and communities. Address root causes whenever possible. Have good long-term effects. Address a prevention mindset. Leverage those key first thousand days. Use things that are evidence-guided. You notice I didn't say evidence-based. If you strictly insist only on a strong evidence base, you're going to do the same 12 things over and over and over, and there's not gonna be room for innovation, experimentation, and building out the research base. So don't do nuts kinds of things, but for crying out loud, try things that the evidence maybe suggests, but that hasn't been well proven yet. And then finally, we need to think about scale. There's fantastic programs out there that do all sorts of things but aren't effectively scalable. Because here's the way I view kind of the cycle that has to happen. We want there to be productive, happy adults in our society. How does that happen? It's one, you know, among many other things, but they're educationally successful. That happens when they have that brain circuitry that's primed for school success. That happens due to those early experiences I've talked about. That happens from nurturing responsive interactions with children. How does that happen when you have those adults in the environment? They have the capability and capacity to do all those things, and that ultimately is influenced by the programs, the policies, and the advice, right? You see this long chain. This is just me summarizing where we've been so far to this morning. So this is really key. 
and we can do intensive but small initiatives like home visiting. Okay, I love home visiting programs. They're fantastic. They often have a great evidence base, et cetera, et cetera. They are also really expensive, and even if we quintupled home visiting funding, which we should, we will still not be anywhere near meeting the true need that is out there. Okay, so we can't just simply say, let's just make sure we put more and more and more into home visiting. Yes, put more, but we also need to think about other types of initiatives which are broader, but scalable. There may be a lighter touch, but we can get them to many people or almost everyone. Okay, so an example of that is one that I've spent um, a lot of my time with, which is Reach Out and Read, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary uh, nationally. Started in Boston, just down the hall from where I was a research assistant coding those videotapes, actually. I'm the founding medical director of Reach Out and Read Wisconsin. We use the primary care checkup, okay, those regular checkups that kids get so much in the first five years of life as an opportunity to give books to the family, talk about reading, and observe carefully what's going on. If I had to summarize the whole thing in a single graphic, it would be this item here, what I call the prescription to read. Um, I actually do hand these out in clinic uh, and, and so on. And again, it's not just about giving away books, it's about skill building with the parent and kind of making those connections. I like to think, and the great thing is it's an inexpensive program. The cost is not zero. We do have to train people. We do need to make sure that they're adhering to the quality model and not just throwing a book at families and saying, read, and that's it. That's, that's not the intervention. Um, but we, it is something that could be, in theory, brought to every child in the country without breaking the bank. Okay? And there's lots of programs that are like that, that are good, strong parenting support initiatives. I like to think of programs like Reach Out and Read as being like the story of the blind men and the elephant. They're all feeling different parts of the elephant and noting different things. Reach Out and Read and programs like it are kind of like that elephant because people say, oh, you're giving away books. Yep, but we're also an educational intervention. We're doing developmental surveillance. We're building parental capacities. We are helping buffer toxic stress, that togetherness, that touch, that, that sitting with your child and reading in a calm voice at night. Uh, it's a relational assessment tool, it's a public health approach, and it is a scalable and actually evidence-based model. When it comes down to it, it's not any one of these things. Reach Out and Read really is all of these things. Um, and if you care to read more about it, um, a colleague and I wrote a piece called The Elephant in the Clinic. This is a free download. If you just Google Elephant in the Clinic, it comes right up. Not a very long read, not necessarily overly technical but kind of helps highlight how you can do so many different pieces with relatively inexpensive interventions. Um, and again, there's, there's other examples that are out there. And I wanna highlight, we're not just merely advice or a book giveaway, but it's a process of parental skill building and support, right? That whole relational health, how can we build those connections, those nurturing relationships? And we're using already existing skilled, trusted professionals, the primary care pediatricians and family physicians who are, are seeing kids so much. And that's really what's key, right? We're not trying to build a whole new network uh, of people. So that's a lot of where the cost efficiency comes in. So to wrap up here, think about this from a public health sort of lens. Kids are gonna fall. You need a net to catch them. Your big net, which has big holes, but it's a big net, are your universal primary preventions. Great, it's gonna catch a lot of those kids. Some are gonna fall through the holes. That's where you have your second net. This is your screening, your targeted interventions, and so on. It's gonna catch a lot of those kids. Still some holes in that, in that net. For the kids who fall through, you got your smallest net. This really is your treatment net. That treatment net cannot take on everyone falling from above. They're gonna fall off the end, okay? So we need to really recognize that that is a key important difference there, that, um, that we need all three layers of this. All le le levels are necessary, none on their own are sufficient. And if you think about what the work you do is, which level are you at? I'm not saying you need to cover all three, but if you don't, that's fine. Who's at the other levels and do you know who they are? And how can you help one another, right? And kind of create that interlocking ecosystem of supports. You can build this into policy. Uh, in Wisconsin, our state legislature actually passed this resolution several years ago. Unanimously, our legislature doesn't agree on anything. Um, and they, the resolved clause was that um, uh, policy decisions will acknowledge and take into account early brain development, toxic stress, adversity, relationships, uh, early intervention, et cetera, et cetera. 
I might have helped them write most of this. Um, it's a resolution. There was no funding tied to it, but it's allowed us to do other work, like a children's caucus forming uh, and other elements. We were the first state legislature in the country to actually get this in front of uh, people, which is why I put the success kit up there with hash hashtag winning and so on. I want to close with a video from the Ounce of Prevention Fund based in Chicago that reminds us of the importance of the first five years and how what we do can make such a difference in children's lives. That's me at four months old. I'm one of the thousands of little miracles born into poverty every day. That's my mom. She's 17 and never finished high school. She's got some big dreams for me, but she's alone and she's scared. This is my first birthday. That's my grandma, my cousin Tanya, and her boyfriend Kevin. We all live together. It's cold and crowded. I hope we move soon. I don't like Kevin. He's always yelling. This is my second birthday. We're all at daycare, strapped in watching TV again. I wish I could just run around. This is my third birthday. My brother William's taking care of me while my mom sleeps. She works the night shift, so we can't turn up the TV, but we get to go to bed whenever we want. This is my fourth birthday. We're sleeping in my aunt's this month. I don't know when my dad's coming home, but I'm hungry and I miss him. This is my fifth birthday. This is my first day of kindergarten. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm unprepared. Because I didn't get the right start. I'm twice as likely to be in special education. 30% more likely to never go to college. 70% more likely to be arrested for a violent crime. Become a teen parent. Drop out of school. Never hold a job. Spend the rest of my life in poverty. My mom plays with me all the time. She smiles a lot now and she knows she's not alone anymore. Grandma, Tanya, and Kevin read me a story every night before I go to bed. I go to my school every day where I get to run and play and see all my new friends. Will and I go to preschool together. Today, we learned about dinosaurs and played a counting game. Every morning, my dad and I brush our teeth and do breakfast together. We have our own place now, and I know we'll always be together. This is my first day of kindergarten. I'm rested, I'm eager, I'm confident, I'm curious, I'm prepared, I'm ready. I am your future. Change the first five years and you change everything. Anyone interested in investing? And with that, um, I always end with this slide here. This is my wife uh, reading to my son years ago. I caught them lost in this moment of uh, b being lost in a book together. Uh, it reminds me that children are made readers in the laps of their parents and that parents are their child's first and best teachers. So anything we can do to help parents see themselves that way, be prepared for that role, and be confident in that role is really what's uh, key there. So thank you very much for your attention and for having me here today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Nassario. Please join me for a further discussion. And Dr. Harrison, if you don't mind joining us also.
How incredible is that? You had me in total tears and then turned it totally around by just the fact that we can give women and families the tools and the resources to be able to support their children, to give them the best start in life, the thing that all of us want for our children, right? How incredible are these two keynote speakers that we have? Let's give them some more applause. Thank you, thank you so much. First of all, we're getting so many questions in across our app, which is awesome. I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, but we will get to several of them. And Dr. Harrison did say it was OK to post her slides yep. um, on our website, Labor of Love website, so you can look for those. I don't know. Same here. Yeah. And Dr. Nassario says the same thing. So that is awesome. Let's start out with one question, uh, Dr. Harrison, that came in. How do you treat people who are, quote, not ready to be treated yet? Ooh. Thank you for this question. Um, so the definition is in not ready. Uh, there's this concept that's called harm reduction. Um, and I put the slide up by Monique Tula during my talk, but it basically says even when a person is actively using drugs, we don't want you to die. We don't want you to get hepatitis C. We don't want you to get HIV. We want to reduce the harm that comes to you even while your drug use is active. And so behind that concept is, although a person may not be ready for addiction treatment, they are ready for something. And so what outreach teams do is um, find out what they're ready for. So are they ready for stable food? Help them with food, build the relationship. Are they ready for stable housing? Help with housing, build the relationship, and then at the point where the readiness for addiction treatment comes, the relationship is already there so that, that can, uh, we can seize that moment. And so broaden the concept of readiness to being able to meet that person actually where they are ready for what they are ready for and then take the opportunity when it comes. That's, that's perfect. I mean, that's kind of what our syringe service programs do, right? Our harm reduction areas connect with those individuals supply them with resources that they need to get into a healthier place in their life, and then they're five times more likely to get into treatment and recovery. If I could also just um, uh, throw something in here that a lot of what you're talking about here is this notion of trust, mm -hmm. right? We, we, we don't like talking about trust when we are doing analytical programs because you can't measure it, right, in the same way. But I would argue that trust is the foundational underpinning of any of these relationships, whether it's a physician or a social worker or a home visitor or any of these things. And when we set up environments where there's high turnover, where we keep moving and shuttling people around, you know, that look you get of like, oh yeah, you're the next person who's here to help me. Okay, how long will you be here, right? You can't develop trust in a relationship and say, hey, this person's done right by me before. I'm ready to think about what they now, what else they might have to offer. And I think there's a lot, I've actually been looking at thinking about trust and how economists look at the concept of trust. Mm -hmm. And strangely, it actually applies to a lot of what we do in healthcare, social service work, et cetera. So, Absolutely. Yeah. It's key to connecting women and families to care, right? I loved your quote about the fact that addiction is the epitome of disconnection. And isn't that what we're trying to do, is connect with women all over our state and our communities. Well, Dr. Nafsario, we have had several questions about this concept of your, your lap. There's no app to replace your lap. And this concept of commenting on cell phones and all the other media things versus what we really probably would, should be doing as parents. So can you expand on that a little bit for us? Sure, and I have a whole talk on digital media, which, uh, which I can come back and do some other year. But um, the, uh, you know, I think the key thing is to recognize that parenting is hard, right? Parents are trying to do the best that they can. So we should not just walk in and be like, oh, great, they're on their phone, the kid's on their phone, you are a bad parent, right? One, if you're putting your child in front of an educational app, in quotes, right? You might think that, hey, this is good for them, and maybe you think this is better for them than what you can provide, which isn't true, but again, that's the whole issue. Um, and also, you know, is it such a terrible thing to put your young child in front of a screen for a few moments so you can get dinner made, put on the laundry, take a shower for crying out loud, right? Uh, these are, yeah, please take a shower. You know, <laughs> Important you know, parent things. You know, and, and, and so on. So I think um, we, we've also moved away from the simply a knee jerk, your kid should have no more than X number of hours, because we've realized that 
it's different for different kids and also it depends on what they're actually looking at and how engaged is the parent in it, right? So quick, quick um, case in point, parent came in, six month old, I asked about his hopes and dreams for his six month old 20 years from now and then I said, wonderful, that's great because I hope they're educated in college, all that stuff. Um, what are you, what are you doing that might help your child achieve that lovely vision um, uh, in the future? Oh, we are watching ABC videos on YouTube together. And I'm just looking and in the back of my head, I'm going, no, please don't put your six month old in front of a screen, right? But I didn't say that because he would have felt like a heel and he wouldn't open up again, right? Trust. I said, it's so lovely that you care so much about your child's learning. You know, those ABC videos only work when there's a parent there with them going through everything. So I'm so glad you're doing that. Even better is get some ABC books in the library and it'll be even better. Mm -hmm. And he was so happy and he was so motivated to go off and do exactly that, which he did, right? That's how you turn it around. Take it from a place of judgment to a place of how can I take that, that parenting energy and redirect it. Awesome. Yeah. I, I love that. And so, yes, please don't let me stop the clap. <laughs> Extending your concept of the lap Mm -hmm. to the pregnant woman, mm -hmm. right? And so many of the women that we're taking care of didn't have that lap mm -hmm. or a series of life events have taken that lap away and they need our laps mm -hmm. to be able to continue that. Exactly. Perfect, perfect. Dr. Harrison, we also had a very specific question about ACOG's recommendation of universal urine drug screening versus a targeted urine drug screening. Can you comment on that, please? Absolutely, so 100% drug screening should be universal. If you look, okay, amen corner. If you look at the prevalence of substance use disorders, um, we screen, there is no other illness in medicine with similar prevalence that we do not do universal screening for. That's interesting, very, very right? good point. Mult the prevalence of substance use disorder multiplies that of anemia screened for in, in pregnancy. Right, and so the reason we don't screen is partially stigma, but also because we don't know what to do once that screen comes back positive. Right, right, very good point. I heard that from all of my colleagues. I don't have the resources, the training, the knowledge base, mm -hmm. or the support within my own clinic to be able to manage these patients. My answer to them was, guess what? You're already managing them. You are already. You don't managing. know that. They come into the emergency room. They come into the hospital and deliver. And then we haven't helped them or their unborn child or their or newly born child. So That's exactly right. And so our stance um, in my company is just tell me what will be in the urine because it's just information for us to be able to help you safely. So if you don't enact punitive mm -hmm. reactions, to positive urine drug screens, people will tell you what's there because overwhelmingly mothers want to help you help them make safe decisions. Excellent point. The other element with universal screening is it helps us steer away from bias, right? This person must, looks like they, uh, that they need a, a, a drug screen, et cetera, <laughs> right? No. Good point. Very good point. Dr. Nasaria, can you give us examples of advice and programs and policies that we that support strong, supportive, nurturing relationships in homes and families? Yes. I, in fact, if you uh, I, if you asked me two months ago, I would have given you a long-winded answer, but I can give you a short, comprehensive answer now. If you go into Google and put in "pediatric supporting parents," um, it's an it's a program uh, that's being funded by six major funders. I've been involved in multiple levels of it. They looked at varying programs and have kind of teased out elements of 13, which I didn't read as one of them, but there's several other excellent programs in there. The goal was not to say these are the 13 programs that everyone should do. The goal was to say these are programs that work, have a strong evidence base. Please examine these more closely in order to see what works for your community, your environment, your clinic, et cetera. These are all based in primary care medical home settings, but they also have arms reaching out into other places. So just look for the Pediatric Supporting Parents Initiative. There's also some work in terms of trying to figure out how we can incorporate that uh, through Medicaid nationally as well. So um, lots more to come. That would be fabulous. In fact, if you can supply us with a link to that, we could Happy send trip. it out to everybody who's here today because I think as we go out more and more into the community and meet with people, whether it's in the libraries or in their homes or mm -hmm. at McDonald's or, or Starbucks, the ability to be able to help them when they haven't had that same type of inter interaction with a parent and to know how they can get started down that right path from the very beginning would be tremendously helpful mm -hmm. for all our community-based workers. Certainly happy to. Fabulous. So Dr. Harrison, we also had a really good question about pain management in women who are in recovery or being treated for substance use disorder. 
when they come back and have their next baby or maybe have to come in for an appendicitis or some other issue. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure, this is um, one of the more difficult combinations, especially say a woman has an opioid use disorder and is on buprenorphine and has a chronic pain syndrome and is now pregnant. It's like, yeah, triple storm. Um, one, as a larger idea, we need Medicaid and other insurance companies to be covering non-pharmacological pain treatments. Mm -hmm. um, that, thank you, hey. although not for me, like for them. Um, <laughs> Because even in pregnancy, we are e even more motivated to not use medications, right? Because we're, we're treating two people. Um, but it's, again, this trust. It's the lap. It's the longitudinal relationship. It's the coordination of care, which we really suffer with. And so if I'm taking care of this pregnant mom's pain and opioid use disorder, being able to get access to the obstetrician and the anesthesiologist before, these moms will often actually need higher doses of pain meds um, in the peripartum period. We have to be aware of if she's on Suboxone precipitating withdrawal when we're, it is like very complicated and has to be coordinated and we fall down on that. So as much as there are programs that allow for the coordination between the outpatient providers and the laborist or the obstetrician um, and then also the pediatrician we want consulted before that baby is born so that we can follow that thread through after delivery. Right, kind of that concept of the entire team wrapping their arms around this Absolutely. patient. So she knows what to expect when she comes in to mm -hmm. deliver. She knows that the baby may have to be watched for a longer period mm -hmm. of time and that we want the room to be quiet and calm and that breastfeeding would be one of the best things if she's Absolutely. on medication assisted therapy and how we'll manage her pain and what will happen as far as DCS being involved or not being involved. Yes. All of those allay their fears mm -hmm. and, and build that trust relationship mm -hmm. that you're talking about. And again, if this is a diabetic mother, do we sit there and say, well, if she controlled her diabetes better, then, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, no, we're not going to give her insulin. Or I mean, that, that's kind of silly, right? So if you kind of make these connections and these parallels, it makes a difference. I also want to say there's some really great work done by a colleague of mine, Sarah Watermore at University of Denver, looking at a combination of rat models and human uh, MRI uh, scans, showing that we know that there's great brain plasticity in early childhood, as I said. There's also an adolescence with a lot of rewiring of the prefrontal cortex. She found a third open window, as she calls it, for remodeling new parents. Yep. And not just moms, also in dads. So when you think about this moment of we have this, this mother, you know, she um, may uh, have a dependence issue, et cetera, et cetera. This actually may be a great time not only to help that child, to help that mother, but at a time when neurologically they're actually most able to kind of rewire things. So it's exciting work. That is super exciting, and thank you for mentioning dads. Mm -hmm. um, so let us not forget the support that needs to wrap around moms includes dads, but dads also experience increase in postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, and postpartum substance use disorders. Great. Another question that came through, Dr. Navsari, is um, are there more exhaustive lists of adverse childhood experience outside of the 10 that you included mm -hmm. in the original study? And which of those do you consider, in your experience, to be the most important? So maybe expand on that a mm -hmm. little bit. So um, yes, that list of 10 and, uh, is not meant to be the be all and end all. In fact, there's been criticism of, well, why didn't you include this and blah, blah. That's just what they went with. And in order to kind of have a reasonable comparison between studies, many people will just stick with those 10 or they'll do 10 plus and then they'll add on other things there. That's uh, there's certainly other, other adversity that it does matter and is important. Um, I don't know that one can really say one is more important than another. And the reason is that there's an individual variation in susceptibility, there's intensity differences. Um, I did not even touch the whole concept of resilience, which is a whole talk in and of itself uh, as well, uh, and, and so on. So um, I don't know that you can really say that. I think the important is, the thing is when you find that there's been adversity is honor that person's experience, recognize that it may alter how they interact and, and engage with you, and then do whatever you can to say, what can we do now to actually help you, support you, and move you along to a place that um, you can be really a, a, a happy, productive member of, of society and comfortable with yourself. 
So I know that we have good keynote speakers when I want to continue to talk to them for the next hour or two and would love to have you stand up and talk about resilience and talk more about um, inherent bias and, and racism. We can't do that today. Unfortunately, our time has run out, but I really want to thank you for being with us and for sharing so much of your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.